Welcome back to the Everything Property Podcast, where we're up to part two of our chat with Matt Jolich from the Higher Than Average Growth software platform. Now, we're just moving through the end of the $350,000 price bracket and then going to move into the five hundred and seven fifty, dollars where I've just asked Matt a question regarding if population affects capital growth. Tune in to find out. Hope you enjoy. Yeah, you, you, you. It would be an assumption that people would make. Perhaps the trend, the trend of the population. They say, look, it's it's coming down. It was eight thousand last year. Now it's seven and a half thousand. Okay, but then the price growth has been happening since two thousand and seven. So what we are saying is that again, look at the metrics that signify price growth. Mm-hmm. So what we're saying is that population has been reducing and price has been growing. Volume of sales has also been growing since two thousand and seven. If we can see here, you know, like why would I look again? Why would I look at medium incomes to see whether pe- people can purchase property? Why don't I just look at days on market where the purchase actually happens? So why do I need to? Why do I need to look at something that's mm. proxy and overcomplicate things? Yep. Just look what's happening on the ground. If people tell me our population is a factor, some buyers agents do take that into consideration. No problem. I'm not discrediting that choice, but what I'm saying is that. Just look at what's in front of you. Mm-hmm. If the Neliquin has grown, let's look at it, how much it's grown. In the last decade, it has grown 78%. <whistles> so it's nearly doubled in value. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and the further back you go, this is just, you know, last decade, but over here you go back to 2007. So it's much more. Yep. Uh, so in what's 2000, that, what's that, yeah, what's th- that process? it was 173K. Yep. So, and now it's, what is 377? Yeah. Yep. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, it could be a factor. And let's say when you're ranking the areas and let's say you, f- you come to a final three, uh, what I would suggest is then look at population as a factor. Mm-hmm. Consider it, but consider it towards the back end. Don't just impose assumptions. Yeah. Don't impose assumptions that could actually uh, make you uh, choose a subpar option. Yeah, discredit an area. Yeah. Don't discredit an area for a reason. If the area's population is going to impact its price, why hasn't it impacted it before? Another one that I hear all the time is, I don't want to invest in areas with a lot of greenfield sites. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, that's fine. So that would stand, it would stand to reason that if there's a lot of greenfield sites now in an area, that means there was a lot more before. Yeah? Mm. Going back in time. Yep. Okay. If I look at its price growth curve, why hasn't it dipped substantially from oversupply? Uh, I could say that uh, yet it hasn't yet because those sites haven't been developed. No, no. So, so let's say, let's say you have an area mm-hmm. that's half greenfield site, mm-hmm. and the zoning is for residential. Yep. Yeah. Five years ago, it was probably more than half mm-hmm. greenfield sites. Yeah. And then you but look. Those that other half wasn't probably wasn't zoned as resi. You, it's still. Yeah. So it's still greenfield site. Yeah. It's still greenfield site that you can consider as potential rezoning. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So. I said, I said it's zoned for resi, you're right, but you know, a lot of areas have a lot of greeneries yep. and it's not a national park. It's not something that you know will not be rezoned. Mm-hmm. It's an, you, know, you see it being rezoned, you see it going that way. You know? yep. Yep. Depends on the release schedules of the council. Mm-hmm. So if there's, if there's um, a lot of greenery now that can potentially be rezoned, that means there was a lot more in the, in the past. Yep. And then I go back 20 or 30 years looking at the price and I want to see, okay, has there been an impact on price when it comes to oversupply? Yeah. And I look at the growth curve. If there's no sudden dips in the growth curve, and by the way, there's no direct correlation between greenfield sites and price decline. It just doesn't but, happen. But wouldn't that be oversupply? No, not right away, because it depends on the release schedule. It depends. So you're looking at one side of the equation. You're looking yep. at supply. Yep. What if there's? So you're assuming that there's no demand. Mm-hmm. That, that's what I'm saying. Is is the greenfield sites? People look at them and go. Oh, these will all be rezoned. There will be heaps of supply on the market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. And then w- but why I've just it? bought in this area and, oh, my God, there's going to be all these brand new homes. No one's going to want to rent my old home. We're yeah. going to be in trouble. But there's why hasn't it happened again in the past? Why Why hasn't... So when you have an oversupply yep. and a reduced demand, price declines. Yep. So you should see on a graph a huge dip. Okay. Before, if that happened before, so let's just say that plate that that town was established and it hadn't grown. It'd be it, the 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 size of the market was the same, and now they've rezoned all this greenfield site around the peripheries. Yeah, and someone that that's owned in there is concerned that once that is all built, mm-hmm. that there will be excess supply, 
there's not going to be as much demand then. And mm-hmm. then, you know, people are going to have the option. They can buy, they can go brand new. They can rent a brand new place while they're in my place, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, we, we as human beings, we suffer from, I guess, fear is a wonderful thing in a sense that, you know, like we... we we introduce a story that we are afraid yeah, of I'm without any to, without any basis. So, for example, I give uh, then to answer to that question is I will look at supply and demand now. So I will look at future supply, which is building approvals. So I know, and depending on my strategy, let's say my strategy is three years into the future, I look at the building approval ratio, and if uh, building approvals are taking a nosedive, as in reducing, in an area that has a lot of greenfield sites, I know that uh, at least in the next two years to three years because from inception, as you well know, from inception to turnkey, it takes about you know two years on average. Mm-hmm. I know that in the next two years, there's not going to be an oversupply of new property. And then if I look at the existing stock on market and days on market and they're taking a nosedive, why do I care if there's greenfield sites? Mm-hmm. Well, what happens I, after the two years? You, you monitor it. So, so for example, yep. so if the, if the three, if, if for example, uh, you impose a rule in a sense that it's an established area. We don't have much in the past to go off. Mm-hmm. So you took my legs off, essentially, you know? <laughs> like, we don't have enough. Like, yeah. if that's the case, then absolutely take the greenfield option as something that you consider, but monitor it. In the first three years, you'll know there's not going to be any. Maybe you change your strategy when it comes to that area. So maybe your time frame from investment reduces from five to three. Maybe you flip. Maybe you do something. But what I'm trying to say is I'm not... Uh, there's obviously, it's an evident thing that greenfield sites can produce supply. What I'm saying to people is just to think a bit further and say, okay, what's going to happen to demand? What happened in the past? Look at the release schedules, see whether how council was releasing the property, mm. releasing the greenfield area. Don't just discount the area simply because somebody sells the green colour on a map equals oversupply. <laughs> True. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not, obviously there's a potential of 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 extra supply yep. but i'm saying just think think through it a bit further yeah okay yeah. great great perfect you, you you're right i'm just trying to no 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 absolutely all these, I, I, all these things i hear and stereotypical so, so, assumptions that probably do your head in you hear a couple times a day no no it's it's not you know what like the main thing is you know mindset i think mindset needs to change in the industry where people need to just look at things a little and, bit differently and yeah that, that's all it is nothing else so I don't know where we are up to, but essentially, oh, the Niliquin. So, I mean, it can take a long time, you know, to analyze every single one and come to a particular conclusion. Uh, when it comes to RCS, you can just filter by RCS and sort from top to bottom and see, you know, Barakna Bill comes in first. Let's have a look at it quickly uh, so we can move on to the next price point. Population only 2,000. Yeah, see, but let's look at the supply and demand. Let's yeah. look at the supply and demand. Again, you know, I personally, this yeah. is how I approach it. I look at history, behavior, yep. and I look at supply and demand, and then I take into consideration other factors. Yep. By the way, you're buying under 400K or 350. Mm-hmm. You're not going to have a population of 50,000. Forget about it, you know, <laughs> yeah, it, uh, unless you buy an apartment. You want an apartment? That's fine. We can filter for units. Yep. But um, let's look at this area first. Yep. Tell me. Uh, similar to, to um, Daniliquin. Uh, volume of sales is a bit better. It's low on the socioeconomics. Rent to owner ratio is the same. Uh, never gone below zero as well. Very affordable for its residents. Days on market is actually increasing substantially, which means demand is weakening. Again, very, if I, and then if I add a low population, I'm like, mm, not really, not for me. There you go. I'll put yep. it on the side. Cool. You know what I mean? Yep. So anal- supply is dropping, inventory is dropping. There's a huge change in sentiment when it comes to, you know, whether you want to live in the area or not, consider, uh, uh, depicted by this squiggly line, I guess. But demand, and look at the look at the discounting. The discounting, if I switch off the days on market, l- the discounting trend is also increasing. Yeah. So the scatter plot, you can see it going up and up and up. Yeah. Yeah. Not so a good sign. Not a good sign. Even though, so this is the thing, RCS considers 80 metrics, but I always say, just look at look at RCS for quick filtering, but then deep dive further. Yep. You know, so I wouldn't. I would pick this one over Waraknabil. Essentially, that's it. Okay. Cool. But uh, you have to do that for all of them. And what I usually do, just for the listeners, is, and I have a spreadsheet. Uh, you create a spreadsheet. You plug in all of the supply and demand metrics, but you also plug in or you write them down. You make sure they write, you write down the trend and you analyze the trend and you give it a score. If you're analyzing what seven areas here. 
seven will be the best, one will be the worst, yep. and then you just tally up the score. And when you come to a particular score, and I'll probably can show you towards the end how I do that for clients, then you apply further discretion and say, okay, but my strategy, I feel this, or I want that, and then you make a final pick. Okay. But that's essentially, just look at every card, mm -hmm. analyze it, and come to a conclusion, and that's it. And what happens there, if you're a buyer's agent, and you have to, um, what I see, I see a trend in the industry where customers are telling buyer's agents where to buy. <laughs> so, which is a bit ironic because it should be the other way around. And it's yeah. not the fault of buyer's agent. It's the fault of, I would say, the media at the moment because, you know. Um, this, is the, this is the P word. This is a classic P word. Yeah. Perth. Yeah. Well, yeah. Perth. And yeah, that's right. That's right. And I mean, and some areas in Perth as well, for example, where, you know, you see a huge banner, Perth price is going to grow 50% in the next two years. And you get a phone call from an individual saying, can you buy for me in Perth? And you as a buyer's agent, I do understand is that, you know, you have to maintain a business, you have to make a living, you have to pay rent mm. and, and put bread on the table, essentially. So it's a bit of a dilemma there what you do. But I always say to, to all of our customers, if you educate your clients, see how we've gone through and I explained why I include data confidence. Mm -hmm. I explained why I include risk. I explain all of these things and I say, do you want to invest in whatever area, we're at Do you want to invest in it? Here you go. But I've just explained to you that there's a huge risk because the man, the man is weakening. And once you do that, I think there will be a shift. It's just that people don't have time, I guess. And mm -hmm. there's the process of educating your customer I guess it is a value add. It's a long-term play, but at the moment it doesn't yield any returns. You know, mm, that's true. Let's uh, let's quickly. That's three fifty. Let's bump it up to five fifty for that five hundred thousand um, dollar mark, and let's have a look at how many it throws up. Is there more out? Is there more opportunity in that five hundred k bracket because it's more expensive? We're dealing with bigger populations and stuff like that. Where did it, where does it? Where is it sort of lends so, us up? So we landed 48 entries instead of seven. Okay. I, okay. Left, I left the confidence and risk in because I will consider the same thing. And by the way, I assume that five, between 550 and 650 is actually a very sweet, nice sweet spot because you'll get great yields. But I think these areas are positioned for you know, above average growth in the yeah, next there's decade. A couple of good, there's a couple of good little spots on this list. I'm yeah. having a look. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so again, so now when you have 48 entries, now when you have 48 entries, you have to uh, introduce additional filters that yep. flow on from your thesis. Yep. You want growth? So, okay, so first we want to eliminate risk, confidence, low risk. The next thing, I would include IRSAD. Remember... What does IRSAD stand for? Uh, just for it, those it, it stands for Index of Socioeconomic... So if you hover over it, Index of Relative Socioeconomic Advantage and Disadvantage. Okay. So on a score from 1 to 10... The disadvantageous areas are one and two, yep. and they're color coded as red. Then you have three, four, uh, five, six, seven are neutral, but obviously the higher they go, the better. Mm -hmm. But they're considered as neutral and they're color coded as yellow or orange. Um, and then you have advantageous, which would be eight, nine, and 10. What about those people that the, the, that would say, though, that they don't really mind lower socioeconomic uh, areas? They're more affordable to get into. And then there's the buzzword of, oh, it's gentrifying, you know, there's more things and mm -hmm. people coming into it being built, blah, blah, blah. Um, take take uh, a whole bunch of suburbs and stuff in and around Sydney, like Campbelltown, for example, uh, to be one. Uh, there was a, there was a, I think I've talked about it in previous episodes, there was a lot of housing commission um, mm. and low socioeconomic um, people or uh, status. We have a house in Campbelltown, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and then sort of the shift was changing. The government brought in a, a scheme that was rehousing these people in different estates. I could say that it's gentrifying a little bit. And when if you've bought in there like in the last five or six years, you know, you've bought in there when it's the low socioeconomic and the story's starting to change now. So my question to you is, do you think that would be the third filter of importance that you would put in? Mm -hmm. at this stage so that's a great question and one that i usually get so mm. um again we're increasing the probability of a particular outcome yep. i have to refer to that always okay. so yeah uh you are right uh areas that are low in socioeconomics uh such as mildura for example which is the first on the list mm -hmm. uh this is not ordered by by you know importance and, and performance but mm -hmm. mildura has seen over 100 percent growth in the last decade that's substantial returns and i think it's got yeah, it's got a irsad of two so um, my answer to that is, of course, areas on the lower socioeconomic standard can generate substantial growth. Um, however, you cannot make a decision only on the basis of that. Yep. 
So you have to triangulate. So you have to see if you have uh, an area that has a socioeconomics of two, which is disadvantageous, mm -hmm. and yet property in that area is unaffordable for its residents, even though it's sitting at 550, because the GDP, coming back to that again, of the area cannot substantiate higher pricing, you're at a risk. Mm. So you should really take into account the low, the disadvantageous part yep. because the unaffordability is high. Okay. So uh, when it comes to Campbelltown, uh, going back to your gentrification uh, question, mm. uh, uh, there's been, and we have uh, spreadsheets on our website which depict changes in, in IRSAD across uh, different time spans. Um, and this is research that's been done by others. We just organized it on our on our. Uh, platform gentrification usually happens at the higher end of the scale yeah um usually mm. yeah and if it does happen it happens very gradually so you, you cannot see a jump from a five to an eight in within one year yeah you know yep. so you can see a jump in five years from seven to eight so those are the two things that you consider so it usually happens at the higher end yep. and if it does happen it's a small jump when it comes to Campbelltown we can actually take a look I think Campbelltown is, although, I mean, I live close, I know the area. So I think Campbelltown is not as low as we would think. I haven't uh, pre-filtered, but let's just check. Yep. So Matt's just going through back onto his website and manually searching Campbelltown to bring it up. The, so it was a bit of a comparison. The internet connection is Campbelltown, New South Wales. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so... By the way, its risk score is above 50, which is good. Sorry, so let's just see IRSAD. Yeah, show me. It's sitting at a five. Okay. S sorry, it's sitting at a five. That's right. So it's So it's neutral. So it's neutral. So it's it's actually, I mean, when I filter, so coming back to our can filter. Can you track that over time to see what it was? Yeah, you can. You yeah. can track it. I mean, can, we you show that, can you show that now or not? No. So we have, there's a spreadsheet. Yep. That you so we would update it on the platform when it changes. Yeah. But the back end, if you go to services and downloadable reports, there is a spreadsheet that's free mm -hmm. that you can download called Socioeconomic Score. Yep. And you can see uh, all of the suburbs have that tracked across time and what has changed. And this yeah. is how this is what I'm saying. It usually happens at the higher end. It happens rarely, and when it does, it's not a big leap. Okay. It's a smaller leap. Great. Great. So um, we'll put all the show the details in the show notes uh, as well. So uh, if you want to go, on, um, if you want to go on Matt's website, you can have a look and um, a lot of free free content, free. Don't have to pay for it and and downloadables. Definitely there to have a look at. So going back to our search, I would yep. include IRSAD, but I would exclude disadvantageous areas. Again, this is just me. I'm a stickler for risk. Uh, I want to make sure that the growth that I want to happen will happen. So. Uh, I cast a wider net. I will never set IRSAD at 9 or 10. Um, I would set it at above 2 because 2 is disadvantageous. Yep. Again, if you if you get three results from this and you see you haven't got enough to work with, set it at 1. Yeah, okay. Go back. But I'm just telling you from the thesis that I think works and I know you, you see the connection in arguments. The next one is let's eliminate disadvantageous areas because we wouldn't invest in housing commission, would we? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when it comes to street level, yeah? So IRSAD greater than two. So what do we have now? 48. Now we are down to 20. Okay. 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 Yep. Now we are down to 20. Okay. So oh, some good suburbs. On so list. what do we want? What do we want? Do we want a warm spot? Do we want a hot, hot spot? What's the difference? Warm spot will boom substantially in the next two years. And you as a buyer's agent, you have enough power to go in. Or investor. Or investor. Uh, that's yep. right. Or investor. Sorry. Apologies. Yeah, I speak, right. speak to them all the time. So it's just yeah, a habit. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you have an opportunity to negotiate and uh, get a discount on the property, which means that you know you'll make money when you buy, as, as they say. You know, uh, if you're buying in a hot spot, you have to elbow your way through uh, a lot of competition. Mm. Um, and if you don't have a substantial network of sales agents and individuals that can help you, you can potentially be overpaying for a property. So it all depends what you want to do. Uh, I'm uh, particularly always interested in warm spots. What's the next big thing? Mm. But um, <laughs> let's Perth at the moment is a hot spot. <laughs> Everyone's over pain to get into. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, go on. <laughs> Not financial advice, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> so, the uh, next thing, I uh, affordability. I want to... So, look, I have to go back all the time, and I know it's a bit annoying. No. We've eliminated risk, 
uh, then risk is tied into socioeconomics. We want people that have you know more dry powder sitting on the line or on, on the line it doesn't mean that they have a lot of cash but i'm saying it's more advantageous there's a high probability they can afford the property and purchase yep. more so you're saying affordability is the next affordability is next after right. irs ad yep. i always go for affordability where is affordability index yep and I, I and i go less than 35 years to own again on our platform 30 years is the threshold when it goes into unaffordability but again it's very contextual um, so I say less than 35, we're still at 20 entries. So nothing has changed. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. What is the next thing that I want to look at? I want to look at, because I have 20 entries now I can even start and looking at the suburb yeah. pages as yeah. we did before, but no, I want to call it further. I want to come to, you know, Give me a top, get, let's get it down to top five, top 10. That's it. What's the next? So the next thing that you have to consider again, supply and demand, mm -hmm. you need to have a reducing supply and you need to have, um, an increasing demand. So I would address the supply first and I would say, okay, let's look at uh, stock on market. And by the way, all of the metrics are color coded and we have on our website uh, a document which tells you the ranges that are opportunistic, neutral and you know negative essentially. But for stock on market, I would say less than 1%. Yeah. Okay. Now why only 1%? So, by the way, nothing has changed. Dev so, devil's at dead with that. Yeah, yeah. so so one percent is considered as a range that's neutral. Everything below is reducing supply, tight supply. So, okay. if it's lower than, if there's less than one percent of the le less than one percent of stock in the market for that particular stock suburb, on market percentage, yes. Yep. Yeah. If yeah. it's less than that, then it's a limited supply. If it's more than that, it's if it's so obviously there are grady, gradients there you know yep. like if it's more it doesn't mean that it's uh, too much stock yeah but you know you have to set a bit of a range to understand and and usually less than one percent you're moving into a tight supply market okay again when it comes to these ranges they're all published on our website yep. so for, and you can actually look at i just um want to show i think it's important because as you say there's a data dictionary so when you open it up uh, there's every metric, including its definition, as well as the methodology under which we've built it and published it, hyperlinked. Mm -hmm. But if we go to stock on market, for example, which cause that's what we're looking at. This is mad, yep. So you have the ranges here. So see, lo very low supply is less than uh, 0 0.04. I went with 1% because I wanted to go from balance. Again, you're casting a wider net. You don't want your filtering to be too rigid and restrictive because again, Finding the right area is 10 or 15 metrics. If yep. you're restricted too much in one, you, th the area might have fabulous nine metrics and you've excluded it from your yeah, search. Yeah, true, true. Yeah. So going back, stock or market less than 1%. Mm -hmm. Then we have inventory. Inventory, I usually put uh, less than uh, 1.5 months of supply. Uh, okay. So that's great. Talk to me about that. Again, the same thing, you know, um, it, it comes down to ranges, inventory, range from memory, so balanced would be everything less than 2.1 months. months of supply is low supply. I put it okay. 1 so at 1.5. So how is that? How is that? How is two months calculated for those playing along at home? So inventory, also known as months of supply, is the average number of sales per month yep. over a year divided by stock on market. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So, and again, you have a hyperlink here for an article about the methodology and everything that you can explore further. Right. So... I put 1.5. What's the next supply card? It will be uh, building approval ratios. How many we're down to there? 14. So we're down to 14. Uh, you're working a bit harder at this price range. That's right. So you have to when when because when you get only two results, there's not you can't introduce more filters. Mm. You just have to analyze what you have in front of you. Yep. But when you have 20, you need to cut it down, and mm. it's it's three different domains. You have the fundamentals, supply and demand. What are the fundamentals? Risk, socioeconomics, and affordability. Those are the fundamentals. Yep. And then you go into the supply and demand balance. Yep. So that's how that's how this filtering is also divided. Nice. Um, building approval ratio. Where is it? Where is the building approval ratio? I usually go less than 1%. Yep. One thing to remember, guys, now is that I'm setting values at a particular point in time. I'm not looking at trend, remember? So these are just the values to narrow the search. We're down to 10 entries. Yeah. Yep. Let's say 10 entries is not, you know, we want a bit more because we still have demand to well, filter Well, in. well, what's top of the list? Kerr in Queensland. Okay. No, yeah. It's actually not sorted by... by oh, on the, yeah, I'm just reading, but yeah. first, yeah, yeah. Let's put 1.5. Yep. 
And hold periods. Why am I putting hold periods? Well, I want, uh, again, as I said before, when you're approaching uh, any research, you have to approach it with a long-term mindset. This is what I do at least because a long-term mindset takes into account risk. So if I'm approaching long-term, mind, if I have a long-term mindset, I need to also consider whether people want to live in that area long-term. So I don't want to include areas that have a whole period of three years. That means that the macro cycle of the area recycles established homes every three years. Mm. So I want to look at, let's, let's, you know, there's, you know, debate about how long a property cycle lasts. It can be from seven to 10 years. Let's go, I usually go whole period seven or above. Wow, okay. So anything below it's too sporadic and the sentiment changes too dramatically for me to actually consider it. Again, if you come back to only two choices, relax it. Come back and relax the filtering. Okay. But so let's, te- let's put it in. Let's test it. Correct. We're at 14. Uh, Correct. 14? 14, 14 entries. 14, 11? No, sorry, 11. 11? So, right. so you're going to put period. this in. Let's test it. G- greater than 7. Nothing has changed. Okay, wow. good. Okay, so see, now we've addressed the supply side. Okay, and that to me is sufficient to find the warm spot. I don't even want to look at the demand. Why? Because demand for a hotspot is going to come in two years. Mm. So I want a restricted supply now. I want the right fundamentals and I want a restricted supply now. And then I can uh, tinker away with these ones. How to recognize a hotspot and a warm spot? Well, essentially, look at the one year growth. So usually a hotspot is a hotspot is an area that has in the last year has about neat they're about 10% or above growth in the last year. Mm -hmm. A warm spot is an area, and see, this is interesting. A warm spot is an area that has minimal growth in the last year and yet has the right fundamentals and restricted supply. Yeah, because it's only a matter of time. Yeah, so it has the right fundamentals, has a restricted supply, but hasn't grown. And what, what, if you want to find the real gem, is you look at the... Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. Show us, go You look at the 10 (laughs) years, so for example, let's say the top, what's the top? Minus 5%. Wodonga, Victoria, minus 5.57%. Oh, yeah. uh, again, Victoria, look, Victoria, top of three. Uh, the top, uh, Kirwan, or is that how you pronounce it? Kirwan, yeah, Kirwan, yeah. Queensland, Townsville. Yeah, so that has grown 13%. That's a hot spot, yeah? Mm-hmm. Uh, the best thing when it comes to warm spots, for example, is having, let's look at the Niliquin, for example. It has had 3% growth, 37 in the last year, and yet it has had 80% in the last decade. So... The 80% tells me that the area has a right fundamentals in a sense that the longer you, s- you go back in past and the longer the area has performed substantially and sustainably, that tells me that the GDP of the area is supportive enough of that growth. Mm-hmm. I cannot discern from one year growth whether the area has the right fundamentals yep. or the GDP aspect of it. But if I zoom out, when in doubt, zoom out, as they say. When you know? in doubt, zoom yeah. out. Yeah, when, yeah. when you zoom out, you can actually see from growth patterns that it's supported by something in that area. So mm-hmm. this, is a good sp- this is a good thing. Like it will be a warm spot in essentially where it's only growing 3.7% and it's got good long-term growth. So yep. I will consider that from warm spot. What's, something, what's bad long-term growth? Like uh, what's, a, what's, a, what's a red flag in terms of long-term growth? Yeah, so... You said so, 80's good, but what, what if you look at Okay, let's look here? at Kerwin. Okay, so... Uh, there's no, there's no ba- good or bad. Bad okay. would be minus fifty percent, like in Newman. Okay, okay, okay. You know that means single industry mining town. I can right away. I don't need to look at ABS. I know it's that. Yeah. But let's Kirvin, for example. It's gone grown thirty two. Okay, this part of the column is also very important. You need to look. F- pattern recognition is the most important thing. So. Uh, again, you need to simplify things. If an area grows ten percent a year for decade, it grows hundred percent in value. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the more uniform the dis- yeah. yeah. It works out. The the more <laughs> the more uniform the more uniform the distribution of growth is across different time frames, the more stable that growth is. Do you know what I mean? Yes. So so the more uniform that growth is. So yep. it comes back to your time frame. If you're investing if your time frame is short or long term, if you're investing time frame is long term, you the preference is to find an area that has a uniform distribution of growth for long periods of time. No surprises essentially. Coming yep. down to that. Yep. If you're so but Kirvin, for example, has grown thirty two percent in the last decade and yet in the last five years it's grown fifty one percent. So it's grown more recently than long term. Mm. Yeah. And you look at the growth curve, when we come back to a growth curve, you'll see that it's gone substantially below zero remember how we were looking yep. at the 
uh, it's, it's had negative growth in the past. Now people will say, but Matt, you know, Curvin, I've made a lot of money in the last two years. Absolutely. And you know what? I will buy in this area. Yeah. Um, it is at a sweet spot of 460. It will generate definitely good growth in the next two years, potentially three. But don't be surprised if the 15% growth in the next three years compounded comes back to two thereafter. Because the GDP of the area cannot substantiate a tripling effect in the next decade. Just think about this, you know, like let's say, you know, you know, when I came to Australia, you know, you could, 100 bucks, you could buy, you know, uh, uh, you, you can fill a cart of shopping with 100 bucks, you know. Yep. Now you can buy three items, you know. So the same thing applies here. Imagine it's residents and this comes to internal and external demand. So... The re- a lot of people say, yeah, but investors put the pricing up. Okay, no problem. And this happens in certain areas. Yep. Re- investors can go in, in an area and let's say residents and investors are piling in. You see a substantial price growth. Mm-hmm. But then the GDP of the area, people are not suddenly earning 100% more mm-hmm. within a year. True. So what happens when investors leave and then the area is w- left to its own devices for its residents who can't afford that property? You're going to see a substantial nosedive. So with Kerwin, you're going to see you know three years of you know stellar growth you know yep but you know there's a higher probability considering its growth patterns in the past that it will taper off and go probably below average yep because if, if it was above average i.e australian average is five percent mm-hmm. if it was above average you would have grown 100 percent, not 32 yep. in the last decade i understand yeah yeah, yeah. so but Kerwin, by the way has phenomenal um, indicators at the moment and and it's and it's great but anyway you're down to 11 uh down to 11 entries and let me just, you know, highlight how a hotspot looks. Again, you can just, when you look at data for long periods of time, you, you just can see what a hotspot is, you know what yep. I mean? And you yep. can discern. So let's first look at its trend. See the belly, how it come down. So there was no growth, essentially no, from 2007 to 2021, because this growth here at this end was evaporated by this decline. Yep. Yeah. So there's literally no growth. So if you want to invest long term, Mr. Client, I need to tell you this. Yeah, it's true. You know, it's true. Y- you decide. So uh, IRSAD is neutral. Let's go down. Look at the GRC, how much is spent wow, negative. Wow, there you go. Look at the negative growth here. So, and it's at the top of the, its cycle. It's at the top of its cycle, so it will decline. If you want to time your purchase, for example, um, or if you want to flip, this is a great metric here. You would buy when it's at the top. And this is what people, you know, there's a bit of a, a decline in market still makes a return. You buy when it's at the top? You can buy, sorry. You buy at the bottom, right? You can buy both. But yeah. let's say you're flipping. You're yeah. flipping. In this market, when it's at the top, when it de- declines, you still generate substantial returns. So at the moment, it's sitting at the moment it's sitting at 10 point, 10% growth. Yep. When it starts declining, it's still going to be at 8% growth. Oh, I get you. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yep. So you can still make money in a declining market is what I'm trying to say. Yep. Uh, obviously, you can buy at the bottom also, but mm-hmm. you know it's either top or bottom if you're flipping, if, you're short, if your time frame is very short term. Yep. Um, and I would look at only essentially this metric. But anyway, long term, I have con- concern about this. I have a concern about this. 35% renter to owner ratio. Those Ooh. are the concerns, yeah? But let's look at, so that's long term concerns. Let's look at the short term. Look at the nose diving days on market. Mm-hmm. There's a substantial increase in demand. And not only that, it's sitting at 17 days. Look at the stock on market is reducing. Inventory is reducing. Hold, uh, hold periods are increasing substantially and there's much less change in sentiment from, the, from this curve. We can see vacancy rate increasing. But, you know, guys, again, you can't find the perfect alignment of metrics. And, of course, it's increasing because everyone's buying. Mm-hmm. You know, everyone's buying property. People don't want to buy. They don't want to rent anymore. So that's a hot spot. Why is it a hotspot? Nose diving stock on market, nose diving inventory, nose diving days on market. Those are the three demand metrics that reflect behavior on the ground. I don't need to look at median wages. I don't care. I don't mm-hmm. want to swear. I don't yeah. care. Wages, here are the wages reflections. It's sitting at uh, 23 uh, years to own. It's yep. well, well below the 30 threshold. Yep. So when it comes to short term, i.e. one to three years, fantastic area. When it comes to long term, I need to tell you that it spent a substantial amount of time in negative zone and um, in the past. Four or five years. Why? The underpinning of the area, the economic underpinning of the area. This, and now coming back to gentrification, mm-hmm. this area is not going to become an economic powerhouse in the next five years. It is impossible. Things don't change that quickly. Yep. You know what I mean? So I have to tell you for long term, these are the red flags. And that's what I say to people. So the, to summarize sort of this area... Great short-term option over the next couple of years. Yeah. Potentially over the long term, 
um, you know, tape. Uh, if I had to uh, have a stab in the dark, I don't think it's going to go into negative growth as much as it did before. Uh, unless, you know, a black swan event, essentially. But, you know, expect below average, below 5% growth okay. compounded. After what? The After. Four years. So if you want to, yeah, if you want to refinance in, um, uh, into other purchases and grow your portfolio, this is a great area because it will grow in the next three years. Just remember then when you refinance, up to what level you refinance because you're going to get minimal growth thereafter. Mm -hmm. So don't turn it into a liability, you know. But, but you know, in the short term, good to generate some equity okay and these are the things again a lot of perth areas see this the same yep. and people you know i always say to people when you put two people in the room one that's invested in perth 15 years ago and one that's invested in perth in the last three years they'll tell you completely two different stories about the area that alone should make you stop in your tracks and try to okay let me consider what i want to do but um yeah, I mean, fantastic area, short term. Mm -hmm. um, and I know people that have been buying there. Yeah, um, it's it's great. Coming back to, um, you well, know. What's something that looks a little bit better over the, maybe it's a warm spot and it looks a little bit better over the long term and it maybe doesn't have the metrics. Yep, so let's, let's look at it. The issue is we have an issue with the actual um, uh, price point because yeah. at a lower end, you're always going to have these little bit of issues. But let's see. Mount Louisa and Burdell, which is again Townsville, the top three mm. Townsville areas. Mm. Um, uh, by the way, I do believe the Kansas is going to replace Townsville. Okay, this is um, my prediction. It's going to replace Townsville. It's just to invest in Cairns, you're going to have to have a bit of a higher price point. But um, yeah, I mean, in this price point at the moment, what we're seeing is that, you know, there's been negative growth in the past, even in Mount Louisa. Look at this one. Look at the stock on market and recent. It's nose diving, inventory nose diving, days on market reducing, again, a hotspot. And we can see that from the behavior on the ground, you know. Let me just look at all areas and see if there's something longer term that's going to generate above average. Burdell, um, it's growth. See, look at this line. Wow. Look at that line. Mm -hmm. Look at this line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Burdell is much more sustainable. It doesn't have doesn't have short and look at the volume of sales which is supported by price growth. This is good economics. Mm -hmm. So I know there's no FIMO wing or something happening in the area where price is growing while sales are reducing. So if I had to say long term, Burdell also went below zero once, then it's touched touched the line after that. I would I would rank this one for long term over Mount Louisa and Kerwin. Okay. You know, but yep. for short term, very close. Uh, only stock on market of Burdell is a bit worse than Kerwin and Mount Louisa, but everything else is the same. Days on market dropping, not discounting. Um, so on a balance of probabilities, I would, put, but I would pick Burdell over Ker Kerwin and Mount Louisa mm -hmm. simply because they have very similar supply and demand for short-term behavior, but then for long-term looking at the curves. And look at its socioeconomics, by the way, man. It's much better than Kerwin. Yeah, well. So again, increasing the probability of an outcome. You look at the socioeconomics and then you look at the curve, while you go to Mount Louisa, or let's say Kerwin, look at the socioeconomics. You know, the lower end, look at the curve. It's like a snake. It doesn't grow up. It doesn't yeah. go towards the sky. Uh -huh. So I will pick Burdell when it comes to this okay, one. Even if it's... It, um, look, what's the... Renter to owner ratio, 46. Yeah? A little bit higher. Yeah, see, see uh, again, remember, no perfect alignment of metrics. But what did we say? We said, I said, livability factor. Okay, let me go down and look at um, hold periods. So there are seven years. They're worse than the other two areas, mm -hmm. but it's still going up. So now it's your decision, okay, what will outweigh one over the other? You know, you have to take a punt at the end, but this is an educated guess. You've considered 15 things here. Yep. You didn't come to me and say, you know, I get, you know, oh, what do you think about this area? And I usually ask people, what do you think about it? <laughs> and then they say, uh, it's grown in the past. Or something like that. Yeah, okay, okay. N I'm not trying to, uh, no, you know, no. not all not all people say that. Yeah. What I'm trying to say people is that there, 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 is a, they, they there, repair, there is a there is there is a general trend of not considering a multitude of factors, you know. So um, this, this, all these three areas are very close, just long-term behavior. Again, if there's a lot of renter-to-owner ratio, we haven't seen an impact in the past growth curve, mm -hmm. you know, not as much as, say, by the way, uh, this area has much better renter to owner ratio, which is Mount Louisa, well, Kerwin, but look how much is spent in the negative growth. Yeah. So it's all horses for courses. What do you want? It doesn't mean the renter to owner ratio would lead to negative growth, but you consider it towards the end of your analysis, you know? Yeah.
True. So um, what are the top areas? I mean, we can spend time looking at these, but we have 10. Uh, I can potentially give a list to you here um, I'll later. tell you what we'll do. We'll format the list of the top 10 in all three price brackets. Yep. And we'll put out there, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll put it out on socials. If you want access to us, we'll, uh, we'll send it out to you. Um, and we'll give it as a little exclusive packaged up for everyone um, that's listening that has that has went this deep into the pod. I'm just conscious of time. Right now we've explored 350 and 500 price brackets. Let's dive into 750. So for obviously this input, we'll go to 800, knowing that in the 800 markets we'll be able to pick up. There'll be some property in there for 750. Absolutely, absolutely. You've left. Are you going to leave all of those metrics I, in? I'll leave all of those metrics in. Again, I need the right fundamentals and I need a restricted supply. We can address demand when you look at the suburb pages. One thing in this instance is because you're increasing the price point, you are evidently increasing the number of entries or potential or possibilities. Mm -hmm. So what I'll do, however, is just to not, because you're going to have the Kerwins in there as well. Yep. Uh, I will say, would you agree if I put uh, between 650 and 800? That's the range. Yep. So there's 34 entries here, you know? So there's much, there's more entries than there is um, uh, in previous price brackets. As you will see, you know, the risk scores are usually higher. Uh, what I do here now is I would actually maybe intensify the filtering. Yep. And I would say instead of inventory being 1.5 months, I will put it to one month. Instead of building approvals being ratio being 1.5%, I'll put it to 1%. We are down to 15 entries already. So wow. just by intensifying the filtering a bit, you know, from mm. 30 or whatever to 15. Uh, if you want to put, uh, because this is a higher price bracket, you want to delineate areas that uh, will have a reduction of an existing co uh, existing stock supplied to the market. So you want longer cycles. So whole periods can be above eight instead of, um, well, let's say 8.5. So we're down to 11 entries again, as we were in the previous price bracket. Um, Perfect. So, and, you know, look at, so you got North S Geelong, actually. This one here, da Dairy Mutt, is, yep. um, I'll, I'll, I'll just quickly do this one. Okay. Uh, simply because, first and foremost, Victoria, you know, has been considered as a plague at the moment, uh, which I completely disagree with. Yeah, it's uh, so silly. Yeah, so I, I don't know why. I mean, I see CoreLogic posting about, you know, increasing supply and just, you know, completely, uh, you know, enforcing generalizability across everywhere, as if everywhere there's a there's an increased supply. But Derrimont, for example... Oh, I was talking more... Uh, everyone's avoided it like the plate, in my opinion, was because of the land tax. No, no, ab issues. Uh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Okay. I, I, n n that's right. However, um, that's one aspect. Let's look at, you know, if the land tax, if the land tax is impacting price, mm. you know, then there should be an increase of listing and a weakening demand. Mm -hmm. yeah, don't that's, don't, don't yeah. just assume that that policy yeah. will completely you know, disable the market. 100%. You agreed. Know? Agreed. Yeah. That's what a lot of people see that. Yeah. They get freaked out. Well, it's like, okay, you might have to pay 900 bucks in land tax a year, but if the property's still going to be charging along at 8 or it's 10%. It's the cost of doing business. It's That's of, exactly what I say. It's the cost Done. of doing business. Yes. So going down quickly, let's look at this area. So I see a substantial reduction in volume, which is a concern, but its price curve is very flat. Uh, it's going up, trending, no surprise. It's never gone below zero, nearly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, It's still sitting at 35 years to own, which is very affordable. Um, and again, let's say don't invest in Victoria is the general consensus. Mm -hmm. Let's look at this area. Has a nose diving SOM, has a nose diving inventory, has a nose diving vacancy. That's a warm spot, remember? Yep. And it's still, the demand is actually reduce, uh, increasing, although it seems a bit flat, but it's increasing. Yeah, Days on market is dropping. Jason market's dropping. There's not a lot of vendor discounting there. There's n none in the last, you know, five quarters. Uh, look at look at the whole periods. Look at the straight line. No change wow. in sentiment. No change in sentiment. It's sitting above 11 years to own. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Building approvals, I'm not even going to consider because not only are they sporadic, but at the moment are sitting at three approvals. So I'm not even going to consider that. And I'm not going to consider, you know, the clearance rates or whatnot. So... This is actually a perfect alignment of metrics for me, both long-term and short-term. The only fault that I will give it is the reduction in the volume of sales at the moment. I will give it that. But looking at the current supply and demand, I don't see, you know, 
I nosedive in the pricing just because the volume of sales is decreasing. Mm -hmm. So if I had to rank this one um, against Kerwin and the, the, the other areas, this yep. is much more clean and crisp. You know, never gone below zero in the past. Well, never, since 2009. It's still very affordable. Growth curve doesn't see any sudden changes. Socioeconomics are positive. And the supply and demand is perfectly balanced, favoring demand. By the way, also vacancies are nosediving, mm. which are not in the other uh, Townsville areas. So if I had to make a decision, to me, this is, this is you know, a winner. And this one, long term, will grow above the 5% average a year, while Kerbin will not. You might generate from Kerbin much more upfront in the first two than this one. Yep. But long term, if your game is long term, and compounding is, you know, what's the eighth wonder of the world? Exactly. Um, Fuck, you've, been, you've been reading my content, man. These are <laughs> words from my lips. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, then you consider this one. Again, I have a long-term mindset. This is how I'm researching uh, how I approached it. If I was flipping, if I was developing, if I had a one to three year time frame, Kerr one takes over this one hands down. Yeah. You know, but I'm approaching it long-term simply because, as I mentioned before, I'm eliminating risk. So, um, yeah, I mean... I wanted to go through this one because recently it's just been annoyed by all of the bad press about Victoria and not because I I don't have a skin in the game, but in this instance, it's actually a positive in a sense that I'm sitting on the sidelines and looking at data. You know, uh, Warren Buffett says, you know, the concept of reflexivity, you know, like um, a lot of people are shill a share because they're already invested in it. Now, you see people promoting an area saying it will grow because they've got skin in the game. Mm. I don't have skin in the game in this instance. So I'm not like, to win yeah, I've got nothing to win. I haven't invested in dairy mud, so I'm promoting it. Wow. But um, in the sense that, you know, a fantastic dynamics here uh, is what I'm seeing and I can give the list to everyone. But looking at, we have WA, WA, we have two, well, three WAs, three SAs, you've got New South Wales, Victoria. It's actually evenly spread out. Mm. So you've got, you got options, you've got even Tasmania, which is interesting. Uh, look at the last year, minus 14%. So again, uh, people will say, oh, no, nah, you know, Matt, this one is a great area. I oh, know I've lived there. It's a Hold on. I've gone through the fundamentals. I restricted the supply. There are yep. many other things to consider. Absolutely. If it's went minus 15% in the last year, there's some problems there. Take it off the list. Yeah. You know, don't hold me to it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, but... um, Annual rate of uh, 95% though. Sorry? That that last one. Yeah. The Hobart. Oh, uh, in the last 10 years. Yeah. Where is it? Hora. I can't see that. Hora. It's a little bit small. Oh, no, in Hobart. Yeah. Okay. So it's done 95% over the last 10 the years. Decade. That's a long spread. It's a but long spread. it's also of dropped 15%. Yeah. Look at the curve there. Okay. So, yeah. Talk talk me through this. Is This this might not be on your list. And tell me why you don't like it. So, uh, well... I, I, oh, didn't, you could, you I could. didn't say yeah, I don't, don't like it. Let me just yep. look at supply and demand. The supply is reducing, demand is weakening. Uh, more people want to live in the area, good sign. 35 years to own. Look at the affordability, it's taking a nosedive. So this is, the demand is going to, how I see things. I see uh, Perth buyers moving to uh, uh, Queensland buyers. Queensland buyers moving to uh, Victoria buyers. Victoria buyers moving to Tasmania. That's how I see the chronology. Wait, go again, go again. What's the so you're going you're gonna to have WA, yep. QLD, Victoria, uh, Taz. Yeah. That's going to be the process in the next five years. The order? Order, yeah. So go. what's the order? Uh, WA. Yep. Uh, QLD. Yep. Into QLD. Victoria. Yep. And then Hobart. Sydney okay. excluded. Sydney might be an overlap of all of those. Yeah. Uh, but and there will be overlaps between them. But I think uh, the hotspot movement will be in that chronology. <laughs> okay. But um, you can see what's going to happen here. It's becoming very affordable for its residents. Mm -hmm. There's probably some dry powder, you know, building up on the sidelines. But at the moment, it's got a weak demand. This squiggly, like it's just unpredictable. I don't know what to take from it. And um, there's been a nosedive in the last... You know what? If I had a long-term horizon, this nosedive wouldn't actually concern me. It would actually tell me that I can acquire property at a very affordable price, you know? Mm. So um, consider it. And it's got reduced supply. I mean, it has reduced supply. Just look at that. So where, they, where it would fall on my list of the 11, I don't know. I have to do the analysis. Yep. But um, if people are concerned that it's generated minus 15% the last you know, year, take it off the list. Uh, but don't take it off the list only because of that. Yeah, true. Is what I'm saying. All right. Well, perfect. What we'll do is um, we'll we'll get some extra work for you to compile 
put all three of these price brackets into the yeah, top ten list of uh, things that people out there, if they're looking for data, um, that they can um, or areas that they can look into. Uh, my next, my sort of last couple of questions to wrap up would be: Is there a couple of areas where, where people can? F- I promised that at the start, and I just remembered it, but. Is there a couple of areas where people can look at finding some of this data for free or in other locations if they're sort of just beginning out and they don't want to sort of jump into software just yet? Is there a few different areas where they can yep. find some of this data from? Yeah, I mean, there's different models. There's freemium models and paid models. Uh, we have a freemium option on the website, but I think you get limited information in the sense that you get supply and demand dy- uh, metrics at a particular point in time. You don't get the trend, which is important. And I think our competitors potentially also do the same. Mm. I think core logic uh and rp data have something but i don't know honestly i don't know with the freemium thing Mm -hmm. Uh, as i said before i used to get it at the back of your investment property magazine you know these days i'm not sure um you know when i started building or when we started building the platform i completely ignored everything else i'm not Mm -hmm. sure where you can get free data Uh, but surely you know um I think they're being published. CoreLogic publishes them as well on regular basis. CoreLogic publishes be SQM research yeah, as well. Yeah, so S- SQM. That's right. That's right. For SQM. a lot of that demand yeah, yeah, data yeah. and yeah. vacancy and yeah. vendor discounting, um, some places. Some look. well, look, Matt. I really appreciate this. This has been mammoth. I'm probably going to split this up into two podcast episodes. Appreciate you coming on. I would. I generally ask for a golden nugget at the end of every episode. One bit of information that is useful and that you can share with the audience mm. do you have anything you off the top of your head if you don't it's yeah. totally fine because yeah. this whole episode has been crazily uh informative and educational but is there anything to sort of wrap up with yeah i do one thing just consider make sure you make a connection between your strategy location and asset don't skip a step that's it perfect and i also need to ask at the end of every episode is what is one quote you live your life by? Uh, if we all think the same, then nobody's thinking. Mark Twain. Wow, interesting. Okay, we'll end on that note. Matt, <laughs> I really appreciate you coming on the uh, Everything Property Podcast. Thanks, man. Thanks for inviting me. It was a pleasure.